All right, and here we go. Let me know if you can see me and hear me on the live stream. This is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. Good to have you with me today. We are going to go into what I think are the top 10 things that every studio needs to have. Not just the top 10 things, the top weird things that every studio needs to have. Because honestly, a lot of the things that your studio needs, you're going to think of already. I'm going to help you think of the things that you're not going to think of, the weird things that are going to save your butt. If you're on the producer side, and particularly if you're on the engineering side, one of your jobs is to like be a psychic. I want you to know before your clients know what they want. And one of the greatest ways to appear to be psychic is to remember to have some of the things on this list in your studio. I want to make this one a little bit interactive. This is a live stream podcast after all. And for most of these live streams, I just give you my thing, give you my spiel, and then I jet. And then when you want to get really interactive with me, we do that in the members only side. So if you want access to the live Q and A's that we do, and if you want access to the uh, mixed feedback sessions that we do in the members only section, consider hitting the join button right at the bottom of this video on YouTube or any other YouTube video on our channel. If you don't see that, it might be because you're on a iOS device. And uh, if you want to join, you can just go into the description and there'll be a link to join there. But today I want to make it a little more interactive because although I have my 10 things, I know you guys are going to have some things too. So go ahead and put them in the chat box, either while we're going along or after I've gone through my top 10, and I'll read out some of your biggest ones that I may have missed as well. So let's get right into it. Uh, we're going to have some visual aids here for this episode. I'm going to bring up my screen so I can show you stuff, so I'll have some pretty stuff to look at. But of course, for those of you who are on the live, um, the audio-only versions of this podcast, we will uh, describe this stuff in great detail for you if you're not familiar with it, because I know so many of you aren't actually on YouTube watching this, or if you are on YouTube, you're still treating this like a podcast and like doing your dishes or mowing your lawn or something. So we'll make sure we verbalize this uh, for those of you who are not glued to the screen. One last quick thing I want to mention here is I look a little different today. I am not wearing my contact lenses, I have not shaved, and I am not in a black V-neck t-shirt. What do you guys think? Can I get away with this look? Part of it is because there was a gigantic snowstorm in the Northeast this morning. So we're starting the live stream a little bit late. Some of my neighbors got up to three feet of snow. Uh, luckily, I had a generator, but I was without internet and power this morning. So that's why we're getting started a little late, and this is why I'm outside of my usual studio nerd uniform. What do you think? Can I make it work? You let me know in the comments or the chat box. Let's dive right into it. I'll get into sharing my screen uh, with you guys right now. Let me pull this over to my web sharing. And away we go. The first thing that I think every studio needs more of, that I've never been to a studio that has enough of these, is short boom stands. I have to bring this up because I've been to so many studios in my day. In the beginning of my career, when I was going from studio to studio, booking out studios as a producer with bands, it was very rare that I'd wind up in a studio, even a really nice one, that had enough short boom stands. These are absolutely indispensable, obviously, for miking things like kick drums, but also guitar amps, bass amps, and not just that. Sometimes there's going to be weird little devices, like small devices that you want to have on a tabletop, or sometimes there'll be certain types of hand drums that you want to mic from underneath. And when you want to keep things from being like this whole sea of unwieldy mic stands, man, short boom stands are worth their weight in gold. And... I think you need to have at least two of these in any studio. Even if you're just a studio where you're like, I'm doing EDM and hip hop production and that's it, I still think you need at least one or two of these short boom stands, either with a tripod base or with these kinds of almost trapezoidal shaped bases that are really great for tabletop applications. It's one of those weird little things that you don't think is going to make your life better, but you spend another 30 or 40 bucks on having a couple more of these around the studio each, and it's just going to make some sessions go a lot more smoothly. So this is the first little weird thing that I wanted to bring up that I think every studio needs to have. For some of you, if you're doing more kind of interview-focused stuff, one of the things that I really should have in my studio would be something like this. Why don't I have a desk-mounted 
microphone boom arm in my own studio. Here I am using a regular big old mic stand to put this lovely Loughton LS208 microphone on. By the way, these are 50 bucks off right now, this month, link in the description. But why do I have this huge mic stand here? For my specific application, a desk mounted one would be much better. And I'm going to like buy one immediately after this. It's been bugging me for a while. So these are the kinds of things that I want to bring up in this week's episode. But one of the major things that I think every studio needs to have is drum roll. Wait for it. Number two. I want to tell you, I want to tell you what someone else told me once about number two. My good friend Rick Slater, maybe he's watching. He was a uh, assistant engineer, I think, and an engineer for Shelly Yakis for a long time. Great guy, kind of came up in the New York City studio scene, old school New York style engineer. And one of the things he said to me early on that I remember had a big impact on me in my formative years as a young producer and engineer was, Justin, it's not a studio without a lava lamp. Now, I'm not saying that you absolutely need to have a lava lamp in your studio, but those words of, Justin, it's not a studio without a lava lamp, has stuck with me to this day. And one of the things that I've recognized again and again in the best studios I've been in is that they take lighting somewhat seriously. Now, this actually reminds me of one of my favorite audio engineer jokes. Are you ready for it? How many audio engineers does it take to screw in a light bulb? Answer, I don't know. I don't do lights. Eh? Eh? Did it work? It's an audio engineer joke. By the way, my favorite music-related joke is, how many hipsters does it take to screw in a light bulb? Really? You've never heard that one before? Come on. Come on. That was a good one. Okay. So it's very hard to do uh, jokes in podcast style. You know, the, the timing doesn't always work when you don't have another person there, but hopefully these are working for you. So you don't necessarily need to have a lava lamp in your studio specifically. Probably the modern equivalent to the lava lamp is the Philips Hue bulb. I mean, there's so many different things you can do with lighting in the studio, but probably the stock choice I'm going to give for you is the Philips Hue bulb color-changing light bulb. Why does this matter? Why am I harping on lighting for a while in an episode that's all about audio stuff? It's because it really does make a difference in vibe and the end experience of the end client. And these are the things that we often don't think about when we think about working in the studio. We think about what microphones we need. We think about maybe preamps and plugins. And we don't think about the things that sometimes have the biggest impact on the actual people that we're working with inside of the studio. And one of the things, I've told the story once before on the podcast, but I'll tell it again. I'm sure not all of you have heard it. When I was assisting at a nice studio in New York City, one of these, at that time, $2,000 a day room, back when $2,000 used to mean something. And who came in but Jimmy Webb? If you don't know him, he's a, a songwriter, wrote a bunch of big songs in the 1970s, Up, Up, and Away in My Beautiful Balloon. Maybe you know that one. Did he also do uh, that one, Who Left the Cake Out in the Rain, um, MacArthur Park? I think he did a bunch of, you know, big songs, particularly in the 1970s. He came into the studio. This was by then the early 2000s, but he was still a, a big name. And he booked the studio just for like a listening session to listen down to some records in there. Some songs, I think, that he had been working on um, in collaboration with someone else. And they were doing a listening session. He just actually came in by himself. And he was in this super bright studio environment, like this super clinical environment. And just something wasn't right about the whole vibe. And I just realized like the biggest thing that I could do for this client right now is dim the lights for him and get out of the way. So I dimmed the lights and left the room and he looked up and around like he was a little dazed and surprised, but then his shoulders relaxed and his whole body relaxed. And after the listening session, he came up to me and thanked me and gave me a hundred dollar tip, literally for turning down the lights. That's all that I did in the entire session. And I got a way bigger tip for that session as an assistant than I normally got for like when I did, when I had to set up, you know, 25 microphones on drums and, you know, there was a 12 piece band coming in with horns and I did do all this stuff. Some of those backbreaking sessions, no tip. But this guy literally 
dimmed the lights for him and, you know, increased what, what I was earning uh, that day by 50% because I used the damn dimmer. So I hope that I'm able to get this idea through to you that lighting and just the general studio environment matters more than you think it does. And some of the things on today's list are going to be focused on studio environment because I'm giving you the top 10 weird things that your studio needs. Not just the top 10 things your studio needs. You already know that you need studio monitors. Maybe you know that you need speaker stands. Maybe you know that you need acoustic treatment and microphones and plugins and synthesizers. Fine, you've got that. But here are some of the things that studios, particularly new ones, don't invest in. But all of the best studios do invest in, and it makes a big difference. All right, now we're going to get on to item number three, where we are going to start to get into weird audio gear. And here I'm going to say that our entry is going to be weird noise-making devices. This one I think is super important. And right now I've brought up what's called a stylophone, retro pocket synthesizer. We're going to have links to all of these down below. There will be affiliate links, so it's another great way to support the podcast. If anything in here is of interest to you and you want to click one of the affiliate links down below, we do earn a tiny bit of money for no additional uh, fee to you whatsoever. But one of the other ones that I've brought up here, in addition to the stylophone, here's a, a next generation stylophone. It's basically like a little tiny pocket keyboard, something that makes sound in and of itself that's self-contained, that is accessible to people who are in the studio. These can be used on records, but they don't necessarily even have to be used on records. Just having these noise-making devices around, like a little weird personal noise-making device, and preferably more than one of them, just dramatically enhances client and artist um, experience in the studio. Another series that I brought up here are the Teenage Engineering series of pocket devices. Here is their pocket operator micro sampler. Uh, another great one is their arcade synthesizer. Here is their drum machine synthesizer. And ideally, you're getting devices that have self-contained speakers in them, but also devices that you can easily hook up and integrate into your main monitoring system is a good way to go. And one other idea that I'm going to throw your way around here is something like this. Here are a series of programmable music boxes. And I've just pulled up some on Amazon that are only about 25 bucks. But these are music boxes where you can literally punch holes into a sheet of paper to write music. And then when you crank the music box, it is playing back the music that you've composed through an actual music box. It's not a music box sampler. It's not a music box synthesizer. It is an actual physical device that makes sound like a music box that you can hold in your hand. And just having weird sound generating devices in your studio that actually create ideally physical acoustic sound in the space you're in, is one of those things that A, they can find their way onto records and they can be a great story, and B, they can just make the whole experience of being in your studio and the statement you make with your studio that much more memorable. So that's one of the other big things that I want to throw out there for you. Um, next item here would be personal headphone mixers. This is going to be item number four today, is personal headphone mixers and personal headphone amps. Let me go ahead and see if I can pull up a link for one of these. I thought I had these up, but I'm not sure if I totally kept them up. So give me one second while I pull it up live. And I will show you one of my favorite solutions for this that is kind of a mid-priced solution. Here we go back into uh, screen sharing. This brand here Technologies is one of these mid-price solutions that is a good bet for this kind of thing. There's two ways to go with headphone amps in the studio. And I find that most smaller studios and most new studios don't have their headphone situation sorted out as well as it could be. I would say one of the highest end solutions to this would be the Avion headphone systems. And you'll find these in a lot of the biggest and best studios in the world. And they are a fantastic solution. They're basically little personal mixers. And some of these personal mixers can be as fancy as to have eight or 16 channels that you can mix your headphones with. 
But honestly, for most studios, these Avion systems are going to be a little overkill. So if you are a studio that wants to give artists a little more extra control and you want to be a bit more affordable, these here technology systems are an absolutely great way to go. Basically, they're going to allow the artist to create their own separate headphone mix. So you can very quickly and easily, with a minimum of fuss inside of your DAW, with aux ends, have separate headphone mixes for each artist. Now, one of these here systems to cover four musicians, there still can be a little pricey. We're bringing up the price here about 2300 bucks street on Sweetwater. But honestly, for a lot of you, even this can be overkill. You don't necessarily need eight channels in a mix for good headphone mixes for your clients. Even a headphone system that has four knobs on it, and there's some of those available, I think, is it Rain that makes one of those? I'll see if I can pull it up for you, and I'll definitely put a link in the description down below. Or even, theoretically, a headphone system that just had two controls, one for me and one for everything else, could easily be sufficient. That said, when you're networking them all together, that solution of just having two channels isn't always that practical. And a solution that's going to have at least four channels is generally going to be more practical uh, because me is a different instrument for each of the people playing. But even if you just have a singer there in the booth with you and they have a little bit of extra ability to turn up and down themselves, turn up and down their effects, and turn up and down the rest of the backing track can be absolutely huge. Now, I do want to give you a word of caution and a word of warning about using these personal headphone mixing systems. Giving the artists and clients and musicians a personal headphone system does not absolve you of the responsibility of doing some mixing on the headphone mix. It is honestly ideal for you to go in there and create the mix for them and just say, hey, if you need this up or down, it's over here. And sometimes go back like in between takes and just check what they're listening and see if it seems sensible to you. And if it doesn't, maybe mention to them, hey, are you liking your headphone mix? I noticed that the bass was like blaring like crazy. And then I've been like, yeah, I kind of did that by accident and was too embarrassed to ask how to turn it back down because he told me three times. So <laughs> using these headphone mixing systems is not to absolve you of responsibilities, to give additional control to collaborators, artists, clients in the studio with you. But you'll definitely want to check in on them and make sure that they're using them uh, in, in the best way that they can be used. Again, if you guys have your favorite solutions for these, go ahead and enter them into the chat or in the comments, and uh, I can uh, shout out your specific recommendations for each of these solutions. All right, next major item to look at here is, oh, this one is good. This one's really good. And some of you are going to be super annoyed at me for bringing this one up. And it is similar to the vein of something like a lava lamp. A Keurig coffee maker. And not just a Keurig coffee maker, but complimentary beverages. I'm assuming for most of these entries that you're not working by yourself in the studio and that you're inviting occasionally collaborators in or you're working with other artists as producer, engineer, working for them. I've got to say, every single nice high-end studio I've been in has either complimentary beverages or a Keurig machine, or in some rare cases, the studios are so big that maybe they have a vending machine and they're non-complimentary. But honestly, in most big, nice studios, the beverages are free. This is one of these tiny things where you giving away $2 to the client can earn you hundreds of dollars in future bookings. When I first started working out of Joe Lambert Mastering, the mastering studio, it was the first studio that I worked in that instead of having a regular coffee machine, had one of these Keurig individual coffee makers. And I'll tell you what, every literally every single musician, producer, or engineer who came in and did an attended session with me used it. I don't think there was anyone who didn't. 
I mean, back then it was probably still a tiny bit of a novelty. Maybe we're talking about, I was probably doing my first records back there and I can't remember if it was 2011 or 2012, I'll have to look it up. But, you know, even 2013, 2014, 2015, it was still something that you didn't see everywhere. And everyone was like, oh, one of those, I'd love to use it. But even right before I built out my own studio and I was still doing sessions there as late as uh, 2017, 2018, you know, fairly regularly, even then, every single client that came in for a tenant session used the thing. And it just, I don't know, it made them light up a tiny bit. And it was one of those aspects of the studio experience that made them go like, yeah, this is a cool studio and it's it's actually worth my money to be here. I know I'm spending a lot to be here, but I got this free like $2 coffee out of it. I swear it has a huge impact. Now, one of the additional benefits to these Keurig machines is they're just a lot easier to use than like making a full pot of coffee. And you can also get teas and things that go with them because another big reason is, is not just the experiential reason, but there's this real practical reason. If you're working with singers in your studio, if you're a singer in your studio and you're doing a lot of takes, warm water, tea, often in many cases, non-caffeinated tea is something that's like essential even as a delivery system for things like honey and leaven, things that can make a full day of singing a lot easier. Having an easy warm water dispensing option in your studio is huge, where people don't have to go down the block to the deli or call Uber Eats. So the, these types of single-serving coffee machines, especially if you can equip them with tea as well, one of the big things that every studio needs to have. And if you have some cold beverages as well that you're just willing to freely hand out to your customers and clients, it just, it honestly makes a difference. And some of the time, these little things and having enough of these little things on point make a bigger difference than spending a thousand dollars more on your microphone. If you already have a three thousand dollar microphone, a $4,000 microphone usually isn't going to impress the clients more than literally just getting a coffee machine, some free beverages, and good lighting. And we're going to have some more elements like this on the list, but we're also going to have more practical ones and more fun audio studio -y ones. All right, next one on the list. But before I get into it, this is probably one of the most important audio engineering things that can save your sessions from going wrong. But before I give you, I think we're on number five right now, before I give you number, number five, which I think is one of the most important tools that an audio engineer or music producer needs to have, this is the tool where if you have these, your sessions are going to go so much smoother and you're going to seem like an absolute mind reader. You are going to fix sessions that would have otherwise gone completely wrong. But before I reveal it to you, I just have to give the briefest of shout outs to our sponsors. Who are our sponsors on this week's episode? As always, the most important sponsor is you. How do you sponsor this podcast? Sponsor yourself. Check out one of our great full-length courses like Mixing Breakthroughs, Mastering Demystified, or Compression Breakthroughs. They will change the way that you work forever for the better, guaranteed, or your money back. In addition, you could also become a member of this YouTube channel. And some of the benefits of membership include you can get access to live Q&A sessions with me where I give you real answers in real time to your questions. You can submit questions in advance as a member for these live Q&As and get guaranteed answers. And this month in March, we are doing one of our um, mix feedback sessions where we're going to take member mixes, dive deep into them, listen to them, even in some cases compare them against some of their favorite commercial releases and give really concrete ideas about what can be improved in those mixes. And if you want to be part of that, click the join button at the bottom of this video or go into the description if you don't see that join button and click where it says join to become a member. It's super cheap to become one and I think it's one of the best values I've got going for you. And also I want to give a quick shout out to Loudon Audio. They sent me this new microphone, the LS208 to try out. Ooh, let me see. High technology. I have the ability to show the, ah, the text link to show up on your screen. Look at this. I'm getting to know how technology works. Loudon Audio. If you go to bit.ly, Loudon 208, 50 off. These mics are $50 off this month. This is basically a front address 
condenser microphone. Similar in profile to something like a Shure SM7B, but you could use it in so many more places than a Shure SM7B. I think it sounds better on my voice than the Shure SM7 that's over my shoulder there. And I think it's going to sound a lot better on a, a lot of voices than a Shure SM7, but it's also going to sound better on a lot of other sources, things like acoustic guitars and other places where you might not think to use a Shure SM7. Condenser microphone like this one, I got to tell you, uh, I think it's uh, working really well on the podcast. Let me know what you think of it in the comments or in the uh, chat box over there. And if you want one for 50 bucks off this month only, bit.ly, Loughton 208 off. Alternately, if you want something that's totally free, GPU Audio. If you go to gpu.audio slash sonic scoop, there is a whole bunch of free plugins there that run on the GPU in your computer. They're available for both Mac and PC. The PC development is a little ahead of the Mac development, so some of that stuff is uh, available even sooner. So I think on the PC version now, they have not only a convolution reverb, but they also have a modulation bundle and a time-based effects bundle. So there's things like delays in there now as well. Definitely check them out, gpu.audio slash sonic scoop. For a limited time, you can get free early access to this stuff. And last but not least, Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. This leads me to number, f uh, actually, man, it's number six we're on already. And one last additional sponsor of this podcast is Hosa. And I got to bring up Hosa because I did a video for these guys not too long ago where it was about the weird adapters and cables that every studio needs to have. And there are a few types of cables and adapters. I'm just going to lump them all together. I have a whole video on this, but the long story short version of this is every single studio, in my opinion, needs a whole bunch of sl splitter cables, stereo breakout cables of basically every type. Eighth inch to dual quarter inch, uh, dual RCA to eighth inch, like every variation of stereo breakout you can get to where you have a stereo often eighth inch or TRS cable to two other types of cables. Also additional adapters that allow you to get audio out of an iPhone and then into the analog domain. On newer iPhones, you're going to need the kind of lightning adapter that's going to allow you to even use one of these stereo breakout cables. So these are absolutely essential. There are also devices you can use to stream Bluetooth. You can find those at Hosa Tech as well. You, and uh, Cali Audio makes a nice one too. You can stream Bluetooth to your phone from your computer using just Bluetooth. And now we're hearing the output of our actual phone speaker. Or maybe you have a Bluetooth speaker system. Something that allows you to get Bluetooth out of your computer and into some consumer devices that can be secondary references for you. I think those are absolutely essential. Also, some of the adapter cables that you're going to need, XLR to TRS, TRS to XLR, microphone adapters like this one that go from high impedance to low impedance. These are, in my opinion, absolutely essential for any studio. If you have these types of cables, the gender changers, the type changers, things like XLR to TRS, TRS to XLR and vice versa, Y cables and splitter cables. If you have a variety of those, you're going to be in much better shape for all of your sessions. And there are literally sessions that would have to like stop, get bogged down in the middle of the day, or there will literally be things that you cannot do in your sessions just for the want of a $5 piece of metal and plastic. Because I want you to get a lot of these $5 <laughs> pieces of metal and plastic, Hose is an absolutely great place to do it because they have super duper affordable stuff. And they have this great cable finder that you can go to to find the exact types of cables and adapters you need more quickly, more easily. So big shout out and thanks to those guys for sponsoring the podcast. And if you want the long version of this, I have a whole video where I recommend specifically which of these cables and adapters you need. I'll try to link to that one in the description down below. All right. We're getting near the end of my picks, and then I want to go to your picks. Number seven for me is going to be one of these, uh, another weird, annoying things that you're not going to want me to say. You're going to want me to say, Justin, when are you going to say microphone preamps? I'm not going to, because number seven is a damn stool. I have been to too many studios, like cheap or new studios, that do not have a stool. And when I say a stool, I'm just talking about a damn bar stool, preferably not even one like this with a back. You should have a backless stool 
like this. Here we go. This wooden bar stool right here in the middle, even something this simple. If you have one that's a little bit more comfortable, maybe it has a cushy top, great. But this is so essential for people like guitarists, people like singers, even potentially people like keyboarders, people playing drum machines. A great thing to do to get great performances out of people in the studio is to make sure that they're standing up and not sitting down. But to be honest, standing all day gets really old. Just being able to bend your knees by like five inches and put your butt down on something without sinking all the way down into a chair is absolutely huge. So number seven is you need a decent stool in your studio, preferably more than one of them. Now, number eight is going to be equally as simple and annoying, but I've been to too many studios that don't have enough of these. And they are music stands and preferably music stands with lights. Now, there's so many different types of music stands you can go with, but I'm generally going to recommend the type that has a solid back of some kind. And this is in part because it makes it so much easier to clip things like lights onto them. That's number one. And number two, it makes it so much easier and more robust to put on things like iPads and phones. These are things that a lot of people are reading lyrics off of today. Even if you're just in a studio where literally no one can read music and you're dealing with nothing but rappers and singers who are doing everything from memory, still having the phone for the notes easily accessible on a music stand, super essential. And sometimes it makes sense to write things down on the spot in paper, with pencil, with pen, and having paper and pen and a light for these music stands, super essential. So you can dim down the lights, but cast a little bit of extra light just on the music stand. How many of these do you need in a studio? You might say to yourself, oh, I'm only ever really going to work with one singer. But is that true? I don't know. If you were on like a one singer kind of studio, then I think you still need probably at least two of these. But for a studio that's going to record full bands, things like that, it's hard to have too many. And something like having at least three, maybe a half dozen, I think is going to help you out significantly in the studio. And it's something that a lot of smaller studios forget to get until they run into the problem where they didn't have them. All right. Number nine, no visual aid for this one. And this is one where it's like, do as I say, not as I do. Because number nine is a good couch. And you might have seen in my old studio, my past two studios where I did all these videos, always had a couch behind me. And I moved to a newer and bigger house, and I hadn't had an attended session in so long. I'm doing all mastering these days. I moved out of New York City. I'm actually in New Hampshire these days. I literally have not had an attended session with someone in the room since 2019? Maybe even maybe it was even 2018 the last time I actually had someone in the room with me. And I, I do mastering every single week. I'm, I'm doing at least one or two albums and a handful of singles or EPs. And there's no attended session. So I said, ah, it's okay. I can do this in a slightly smaller room as well as it's really well treated. And I don't need the space for a couch for someone behind me because I've, I've had no attended sessions. And one of my biggest regrets about this space is not having a couch behind me. Even just for me. Because often I do some of my best listening and my best working when I'm not looking at the screen, when I'm not touching anything, when I'm not fiddling with knobs. And when I in the past have went and just lied down on the couch, all of a sudden everything I need to do comes into focus. And I stop listening in an overly zoomed in way. Just getting physical space, physical distance from the place where you're doing your mixing or your mastering, just to be able to go back there with a pen and paper is absolutely huge. But there's not only this component, it's another component that I've seen in some relatively kind of nice mid-price studios. I had a guy call me up for a coaching call. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching calls for my clients where I help them go through their mixes or I help them you know, figure out how to move forward in their careers. And for this particular guy who had a studio out in the Pacific Northwest, great studio, tremendous gear. There were tens of thousands of dollars worth of gear in there. And he was asking me, Justin, I'm not sure what to buy next. Like I could buy this 
you know, $2,000 preamp or we have this beautiful old compressor that I could get fixed. They don't get used on a lot of sessions, but I just know that like having these additional pieces would just make me even more confident in my work and all that. And the whole time I'm talking to him, I can see him. And I can see his whole studio. And the only thing I can see is his couch. It looked like it had been chewed apart by a dog. And here we have this gorgeous studio with a full analog mixing console and all these analog devices. And behind him is the Vibe Killer. The couch that, that almost looks like it would smell like a wet dog. I don't know if it was actually chewed up by a dog. It might have just been sat on for so many years. But it had the, the look and visual aesthetic of a wet, smelly dog. And I said, dude, before you buy any gear, you need a nicer couch in that studio. Because you're talking about how am I going to book more clients? How am I going to get enough clients to really make a go of it where I'm, I'm getting a solid income? And I'm like, your gear is okay. But one of the big things that's going to turn people on or off about your studio is whether they were comfortable with the vibe and the environment when they sat down. And there's a lot of parallels between this and lights that we were talking about earlier. But I can't tell you how essential it is to have clients have a space where they sit down and they feel like, yeah, I'm in the studio. It's a vibe. So you need a good couch. All right. Now that we've gone through my top nine, I'll finally give you number 10. And this is the one where it's like, okay, fine. I'm going to give you what you want. Here's what you came wanting to hear. Yes. Number 10 is you should have one sexy microphone. It doesn't necessarily have to be even the microphone that you use the most on every single session. Ideally, it would be. But when it comes to gear, probably the first two things to work up towards are, one, speakers and acoustic treatment. I mean, this is the most important piece of gear in your studio is your monitoring environment and the whole room in which you're recording and listening to everything. I didn't put this one on the list because it's so obvious, and I say it all the time, that I didn't want to make it another entry on this list, that you've got to get your listening environment on point. Some treatment, monitoring you can trust, or failing that, really nice headphones that you can trust. So I'll give you what you wanted me to say the whole time, which is fine. You need one super sexy microphone. And it's much better for you to overspend on microphones, at least one of them, than it is to overspend on things like preamps, outboard compressors, outboard EQs, too many additional instruments once you have enough good instruments in your studio that just adding on the one sexy microphone where you're saying, all right, fine, it'll pay for itself over time and it's just going to give me confidence and credibility. And if you are going to do this, some of the obvious examples to look at as the one sexy microphone, I mean, obviously the number one is going to be a Neumann U87, right? Right. This is the microphone where you're spending $3,700 and it's like, yes, you can use it on everything. Use it on acoustic guitar, it sounds good. Use it on vocals, it sounds good. Um, use it on percussion, it sounds good. Use it as a single overhead on drums, it sounds good. Are there certain microphones that are going to outperform in, other, in, in certain places? Absolutely, yes. But this is one option. There are other options these days. You could go for the modeling alternative to this kind of thing. And this might be sufficient for you. Something like the Sphere microphone systems that only cost something like twelve hundred to fifteen hundred bucks could be a suitable alternative to the one nice high end analog microphone. But I kind of feel like if you don't have the one sexy high end analog microphone, that you're going to be annoyed at yourself that you don't. So. Setting aside budget to spend anywhere from a thousand to three thousand dollars on an all analog good microphone that's a signature vocal microphone that you feel like you can use in a lot of places is absolutely a good idea. And as much as I want to advocate that it's maybe even better to have a variety of cheap microphones, because honestly, on a lot of singers, the Shure SM7 or the Shure SM58 is going to sound better at something like 100 bucks than a $4,000 microphone. Singers like Bjork, Bono, uh, there's so many people sing through SM58 in the studio, and that's their studio vocal sound. 
but that said, there is something about the calling card vibe of, yes, we, we're a serious studio and we have a serious microphone. Everything else on this list was literally in the couple hundred dollars range or less. And this is the one thing that isn't. If you really want me to give you permission to buy more high-end audio gear, I'll give you 11 because all of my list of 10 go to 11. And I'll say, okay, fine. Get one really good channel strip. And by channel strip, I mean something that has preamp, compressor, and EQ built in. I mean, one of the classic uh, combinations with a uh, something like a U87 would be the Avalon 737, another $3,800 unit. And like for the longest time, you go into a studio, especially with like hip hop or R&B sessions, and like they had the U87 and the Avalon, that's how you knew it was serious and we're in good shape and you're going to have a vocal sound you can trust. You can get great vocal sounds with gear that is way less expensive than these. And I'm not saying that for you and the stuff that you're doing, that the Avalon and Neumann U87 combination is the thing that makes sense. It's just such a almost cliched option for certain genres that it just came to mind. But having the one nice high-end microphone and the one nice high-end channel strip allows you to get away in so many other places with having gear that doesn't necessarily have the name recognition, doesn't necessarily have to be the most super expensive. But when you have your bases covered there and you're like, yes, I do have this super high-end microphone, but I don't know, on you, even though it's not our most expensive microphone, this is the one that I think is going to sound best. All of a sudden, your recommendation that the $500 microphone is going to sound just fine on them or the $100 microphone is going to sound just fine on them seems more credible. So that's something to work for, uh, work towards, is the one high-end microphone, the one high-end channel strip. Well, that's all that I've got for my top 10 things, that, weird things that every studio needs to have. Let's see if you guys put in some of your own recommendations. I'm going to go ahead and read from our members first. We've got a whole bunch of people here, Music 7 Studios, Benj, uh, Ant-Man Felix, a whole bunch of our uh, regular members came here. So I'll go ahead and read out uh, their recommendations first. If you want to put a super chat in there and you're not a member, that'll make me see it immediately. But I'll see if I can go through uh, a few of the comments that came in from uh, our viewers and members here. Skeleton Pete says, black light, I think my black light posters are still in my basement. Hey, that's a good alternative to the lava lamp. Um, Skeleton Pete says the Beatles were playing with a stylophone in the Get Back documentary, and that part, that thing is a hoot. Ben says placebo faders are a good thing to have in the studio, worth labeling one of them as lead vocal. That's a good one. Uh, let's see if we get uh, any more here from uh, any more recommendations. Music 7 Studio says, get a bagless vacuum with a HEPA filter and a built-in feather duster that the vacuum cleans, essential for electronics that pick up dust. Eureka Studios has one. Yeah, these are the, the kinds of things that we, we don't think of when we think of recording studio that can make your life easier. He says, they aren't terribly expensive now, but I bought a display model of a vacuum that I had for years at discount because it was all that they had left in stock. Um, this is beautiful. This is even nerdier and weirder and more esoteric than my suggestion. So uh, feel free to throw your own stuff in there. Um, a lot of people are definitely getting into the idea of vibe here and how important it is. Uh, Benj says, uh, a trackball. That's actually a huge thing. Man, for those of you who spend a lot of time mousing around, I will add to this. I've recently switched to a vertical mouse. I tried trackballs. I used trackballs for years in uh, older studios, but I don't know. I still felt wrist pain with them. The best thing for me so far has been this vertical style of mouse, which changes my hand position and has dramatically cut down on things like elbow and wrist pain. So for those of you who are mousing around like crazy and have trouble getting acclimated to a trackball mouse, I'll totally recommend this style of vertical mouse. Let's see if there's any more live questions that have come in. Music 7 Studio says, serious question, but how about a rug? That's actually not a bad idea. I have a rug beneath me, and I found that it helped pretty significantly with early reflections on my voice. I have tons of acoustic treatment here. I have acoustic treatment 
above me overhead right now, but just adding in a rug in this room really helped control some of the early reflections. It depends on what you're going for. If you need your studio to be drier, particularly in high frequencies, and you're not getting it with a reasonable amount of acoustic treatment on the wall, then absolutely adding a rug into the mix is one of these things that can be super useful for a studio to have. Uh, ben says he's been using the Toby Eye Tracker and Trackball instead of a mouse. Interesting. I'm not familiar with that. I'd like to find out more about it. Uh, let's see if I can find any more questions in here as we are, or uh, additions in here before I put this stream to an end. Um, another comment for real nice lighting. <laughs> Someone here is saying a real ostrich feather duster should be number one thing. Oh, Music 7 Studio says, what about a dimmer switch level knob on the lights to help with atmosphere? Absolutely. So one of the cool things with the Philips Hue Bulb solution is that you can control with your phone. And if you get one of the color changing ones, you can change the whole vibe of the studio in space. They also make even more inexpensively um, some options that uh, don't do the color changing. But you could get for all the lights in your studio once, and this can be a less expensive solution, a dimmer switch. And I have a dimmer switch in here as well. But not any type of dimmer switch will do. You can't just get the cheapest type of dim dimmer switch because they can actually cause interference in your studio. So you want a basically transformer isolated dimmer switch. Uh, that's super essential that you get a dimmer switch that isn't going to cause noise in your studio. These usually I find are a little bit more expensive. It's not going to be a $12 dimmer switch. It might be more like a $20 or $30 dimmer switch uh, last time I checked. But super essential if you don't want to introduce noise when you're dimming things down in your studio, which I don't think any of us want to do. All right, let me know if you want to add any last items in here. Um, interesting, Music 7 Studio says, I'll add that in a humid environment, get a charcoal canister that pulls humidity out of the air around guitars and other acoustic environments. Yeah, if you are in a particularly humid part of the world or you're in kind of a makeshift studio, dehumidifiers are super great to have. Uh, and there are dehumidifiers that are more advanced than what Music 7 is talking about here that will actually uh, pull moisture out of the air pretty aggressively. They're pretty noisy, so you want to dehumidify the space before you know recording. But also humidifiers can be super essential for any spaces in which you have a piano or things like acoustic guitars. And keeping the room at humidity level of somewhere from you know 40 to 50 percent is usually pretty recommended. Some places will actually put their humidifier under the piano so that they'll need fewer tunings. And the evaporator style of humidifiers, I think, are a great way to go. If you're in a place like where I am in the Northeast, in the winter, heaters come on, the humidity drops, and then all of a sudden, things like guitars and pianos don't stay in tune nearly as well. And it can also be a problem for singers continuously singing over a full day. And just getting the relative humidity up to 40 to 50% in that room can really help longevity of vocalists in the room as well as some of your more wood-based instruments. Uh, James uh, says, cinema panels. I'm not sure if I know what those are. And Jam Pro Sound says, a good selection. Oh, this is a great one, Jam Pro. A good selection of new strings, picks, sticks, and batteries. Oh, I love this. I think that I wrote this list once before and then didn't save it. And this was totally on my list. And I will add to that drum heads. So good selection of strings, picks, sticks, and batteries. Absolutely. These are things that can totally save a session. Should musicians bring their own changes of strings and their own picks? Yes. Will all of them? No. Will all drummers bring in their own, uh, have fresh, clean drum heads on their drums? No. <laughs> Should they? Yes. Will they? No. Another thing that I'll add after the signature microphone, when we're talking about more studio gear, is drums, specifically snare drums. I've really got to say that one of the things that you could add to your studio that is going to give you a significant benefit is having two or three different types of snare drums in your studio. If you record a lot of different acoustic drums, but drummers bring their own kit in, or you even if you have a house kit, just having a choice of snare drums. 
Specifically, I'll bring up some of the models for you that I think are some of the best ones to have. Let's bring up the screen here. I've got to say the Ludwig Superphonic is one of those snare drums that you have heard on so many records that it just instantly sounds like a snare drum. And this was one of my favorite purchases that I ever made when I was doing more producing and recording. I would travel from session to session with a whole bunch of, you know, my mic preamps and some of my compressors and a whole bunch of microphones and extra stands and cables. Like I had a whole rig with me. And the sexiest, most important things in that rig, right, were things like my preamp and my outboard hardware and my microphones. But honestly, the thing that helped my drum sounds more than any of that was having a awesomely tuned Ludwig Superphonic in a case that I could just plop down. And it's one of those things where you put a well-tuned Ludwig Superphonic onto a snare sound, a snare stand, and it just sounds like a drum is supposed to sound. And you're like, oh, we got it. Like, we're done now. Like, did you did you change the mic? No, I changed the drum. And it's one that I tuned in advance of the session. Man, so useful. An alternative to the uh, Ludwig Superphonic that is even more relative, I think, for harder rock stuff would be a Ludwig Black Beauty, which has a lot in common with the Superphonic, but maybe you could say it has a bit more of an aggressive sound and a slightly more modern sound. Maybe there's a little bit more bite in the uh, Black Beauty compared to the Superphonic. Well, I think the Superphonic is being a little bit crisp but mushy. The, the Black Beauty has this kind of uh, a little bit of bite and aggression. It's one of the probably most recorded hard rock drums of all time. Also having some type of maple shelled drum is just an additional tone that you can add into there. But if you don't want to have a collection of a dozen drums, like would be, uh, my ideal is to have like a dozen snare drums in my studio. If that wasn't going to be the case and you just wanted to have a few of them, then maybe you're getting one of these two uh, metal shell drums, either a Superphonic or a Black Beauty, depending on what types of music you record more often. And then maybe for your wooden drum, you're getting one that is a slightly different or slightly odder size, that maybe you're getting more of a piccolo snare drum, or you're getting a snare drum that is, you know, deep, but um, uh, but smaller in circumference, so it's higher pitched. So those are some things to think about is snare drums. And then if we're going to go down this path of more sound generating devices, the weird things you should have in your studio that make a big difference and sometimes bigger than things like your microphones, your preamps, your compressors, et cetera, would be guitar amps. And just having some good small tube amps in the studio, man, can be absolutely awesome. If you're just going to have one um, small amp in the studio, the Fender Pro Junior is an absolutely great way to go. Um, also, their, their Blues Junior, another good way to go. But there are also amps like the Little Fender Champs or the Little Fender Princetons. And there's a whole bunch of other brands that make small tube amps. Some of the small Mesa Boogies, the small Orange Amplifiers. Man, some of these, just having a couple of small tube amps in the studio that you are absolutely wild over the sound of can make so much more of a difference than some of the traditional audio gear that we often think of. And with that, I'll give it one last quick look in the live chat here for uh, additional recommendations, and then we will uh, move on to ending this one. All right. You know what's, what I love about this chat right now is what's happening in the chat right now is people are talking about bagless vacuum cleaners and feather dusters. So here I was trying to get annoying with the weirdest things I can think of. And you guys have out weirded me. So I super appreciate it. Hey, if you like getting super weird with me, do you want to get like super duper weird with me? The best way to do that is becoming a member of this channel and we can get hella weird. Some of our live Q&A sessions, we've done like two and three hour calls where we go through some of like the most nerdy esoteric questions you have. There's a lot of back and forth with me and people in the chat. And in future iterations, I'd love to see if I could even start bringing some of you on in video in the member section. We can start having even more of a dialogue in some of these. would be wonderful. But the thing that I'm really excited about is when we do our mixed feedback sessions, because I know these can dramatically improve and change the way people mix forever in just one session by having someone who's listened to thousands of tracks in the studio, mastered thousands of tracks, has some, you know, gold and platinum credits to his name, listen to this stuff alongside with you and just say, 
here, top three things that you can address in your mix. Address it in this mix, and chances are it's happening in your other mixes. Do you know how much this costs? Right now, I'm doing introductory pricing for members. It is $5 per month, and you get the exclusive live Q&As and your music in our mix feedback sessions. I think you're going to love it. But if you want to go super deep, super nerdy, super weird, check out some of our great full-length courses like Mixing Breakthroughs, Mastering Demystified, and Compression Breakthroughs. They will change the way you work forever for the better, guaranteed or your money back. Every single one of the testimonials on these websites is true and from like an actual real person who loved the courses. I actually got an email from someone recently listening to this podcast who said, Justin, I want to buy one of your courses, but I can't find an impartial review of it anywhere. Unfortunately, there's not like an Amazon for gear reviews, uh, for course reviews that I can send you to that has, you know, trustworthy reviews. Although some of those Amazon reviews these days are not very trustworthy anymore either. Man, uh, that was an experiment that worked for a while. Like, oh, we'll get trustworthy user reviews on Amazon. I don't think that's the case anymore. But what I will tell you is I would literally jump off a bridge before I put a fake testimonial on one of the pages for one of my courses. So when you're reading those, you're reading the actual experience of people who have taken these. But the best thing you can do is experience them for yourself. There's a money-back guarantee on these, and almost no one ever uses them because basically almost everyone who takes them, they're like, wow, that really helped more than almost anything that I've done and more than almost any gear purchase I've made. So check them out, Mixing Breakthroughs, Mastering Demystified, and Compression Breakthroughs. Last quick thing I got to tell you, some free stuff for you and some discounts for you. I should mention that over at sonicscoop.com slash contest, that's sonicscoop.com slash contest, we are giving away a microphone from Soyuz. We give, we give away like $100,000 worth of free gear every year. Go over to sonicscoop.com slash contest. This giveaway is just about to end right now. A nice condenser microphone from Soyuz. Also, another free thing, GPU audio. I did it. I put it on screen here. GPU.audio slash sonicscoop will get you early access for free to some plugins. You will get, if you're on Mac, absolutely their Convolution Reverb. But on PC, they now have the modulation bundle and the time manipulation bundle where you're, there are now things like delays as well going on, modulation effects. Totally free for now. Runs on the GPU in your computer. Go to gpu.audio slash sonicscoop. Also, big discount. If you're looking for a condenser mic alternative to the Shure SM7, uh, something that you can use as a singer vocal mic, as a dialogue mic, as a kick drum mic, as a snare drum mic, as a guitar mic, as an acoustic guitar mic, as an amp mic. This microphone I'm talking right now is the Loughton 208. It is the LS 208. A couple cool things you should know about it. One, it is front address with extreme rejection of the sides. The prior microphone I was using in this space had a really wide cardioid pattern, and you heard much more of the room in here. Regardless of how well treated it is, you still heard some of the room. Here, we're hearing so much less of the room because of how focused this pattern is. It really has great rejection of bleed, so it makes it a great stage as well as studio mic when you have multiple players together. Or if you just want to reduce the impact of a less than ideal room, it really is going to reject more of the reflections than a wider cardioid pattern. So the tight cardioid pattern on this one, great thing for multiple musicians playing together and great thing for unideal rooms. Also, it has extremely high SPL handling. So this thing can pick up whispers, but it can handle being put right up in front of a kick drum, screaming loud guitar amps, really high distortion-free SPL handling. So check it out. These are 50 bucks off this month at bit.ly slash Loughton 208 dash 50 off. Bit.ly dash Loughton 208 dash 50 off. I probably could have made an even more user-friendly link, but hey, I'm new at this stuff of putting these things up on screen, so hope it worked for you. Uh, last but not least, Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. And also a big shout out and thanks to Hosa with her lovely cable finder. If you do go out and get a whole bunch of additional adapters and cables for your studio on my recommendation, I definitely recommend checking out Hosa because these are cables that I want you to have a ton of because you're only going to use a few of them. Uh, you're going to use each of them a few times, is what I mean to say. The weird cables and adapters that you need in your studio, you might use them five to ten times in your life, but each of those times they're going to like totally save the day. So go over to hosatech.com where you can load up on the types of weird cables and adapters you really need to round things out. 
Well, I hope this one was useful for you. If you're not catching the live stream, I always like to hear from you in the comments so you can leave your comments for things that you think I've missed or specific models of some of the things I've mentioned that you've preferred. And there are going to be links in the description down below where you can get uh, some of our affiliate links, which is another great way to support the channel. Speaking of supporting the channel, thanks for being here. If you got this far, hit like, hit subscribe. It was fun hanging out with you. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time.